Hi there, thanks for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and this video is entitled Plot, Narrative, and Meaning. In its simplest terms, plot is just what happens in the story. That is, the arrangement of the action in the liter literary narrative. The order in which the events, actions, conflicts occur. What's the function of plot as an element of story? Uh, well, the plot gives structure to the text. It's the backbone, the skeleton. It gives it a shape by organizing the events and characters and all the things they do into a recognizable narrative, into a pattern. Plot is centered on characters. It's what the characters do, how they are affected by the events around them, how they act, react, and interact, and how they change over the course of the story. And plot obviously has to do with cause and effect. That is, one character's actions or reactions lead to another conflict, lead to another event, etc. But plots can also suggest hidden causes and effects, things that aren't obvious. And the plot is ultimately why we read, right? We read for stories. We like to, to be told stories. We like to imagine new scenarios and see people in interesting situations. So the plot is fundamental to just our enjoyment of the story. In terms of story structure, we can break it down, start with just a very simple beginning, middle, and end. If we think about every story has a beginning, it starts somewhere, it has a middle, things happen, and it ends. There's a conclusion. So in the beginning of stories, this is where we see the world established and characters introduced. And there's always some sort of status quo, right? We're coming into a situation where people are living their lives, doing whatever they do. And there's some sort of conflict or change that breaks the status quo. That's how a story starts. A story is when something interesting happens, when something out of the norm happens. Then after this beginning, after this conflict emerges to change things, the characters respond and complications ensue. Right? Something happens because of this conflict and the characters have to react to that. And further characters, further, excuse me, further complications may result based on what the characters do. That is, they react to the initial change and that causes another conflict, then they react to that, then that causes another conflict, and so on. And finally, at the end of the story, the events coalesce into a new, more or less stable situation, a new status quo. And the characters have been changed, hopefully. Sometimes they haven't been changed, and that might be part of the story. And the world has changed somehow. So the end, we are, in a sense, returning to the beginning, but with things now transformed based on the characters' actions and reactions to all the events that they've been through. Let's look at uh, this beginning, middle, and end structure in a slightly more complicated model. Uh, so this, what we see on the screen here, this is called Freytag's Pyramid, named after uh, a German critic named Gustav Freytag, who in the 1800s was trying to come up with a way to, uh, to schematize how all stories are structured. He was trying to come up with a universal set of terms uh, and a universal model that could be applied to pretty much any story that's been told in any medium, whether that's plays, novels, whatever. And this is the pyramid that he came up with. And it's a useful, although, of course, as any tool, somewhat limited, uh, but it is a useful tool for understanding and breaking down how plots are structured and the different elements and events that occur in any story. So it begins with the exposition. This is just a more complicated word for beginning uh, because the status quo is exposed. We are exposed to the world around us. Um, we see the characters, we see their normal lives, we see the, the situation of the world that we're entering. And it's usually very brief. Expositions are, are usually uh, fairly short, and they rely on familiar elements. Even if we're in a strange world, it relies on uh, stereotypes or familiar images, events, actions, so that we can be brought into the world and understand what's happening. And this exposition, uh, the status quo, is then broken by an inciting incident. That is something, some conflict or change that's introduced that breaks the routine of the status quo. And this could be a positive incident or a negative incident. 
but something happens again to incite a change. So the status quo is disrupted and this conflict and change start to develop. And this is what's called the rising action because we're rising towards the story's main point, the climax and tension energy is being built. Conflict is being built. The characters act and react to the change. They react to their conflicts with each other. Further complications and actions and reactions might result. And this is usually the largest section of the narrative. This is really the story that we want to read, right? We want to see how people react, what the complications are that ensue when something strange, interesting, dramatic, tragic, wonderful happens to the characters. We want to see what they do. And that's the rising action. As the actions and conflicts continue, as the complications build up, the action builds in the story builds in intensity till we reach a crisis point. The conflicts uh, between the characters or between the characters and their situation reaches a point of ultimate crisis. And this is the climax of the story. This is where everything comes to a head. And as a result of this crisis and climax, terms that are roughly synonymous, although there is a slight difference, which I'll go over in a few slides. But when we reach this point, this is where the character's actions finally transform the situation for good, ultimately. So whatever happened, the inciting incident and all the complications that have uh, uh, ensued are now in some sense dealt with. In some sense, we've turned a corner and we're no longer following from the complications of that inciting incident. This doesn't mean that it's necessarily a successful transformation. It just means that that rising action has ended and now we're moving towards the conclusion, the resolution of the main story. And as this crisis and climax, uh, we see the fallout from it, whatever has happened to ultimately deal with the, the conflicts and problems that have happened. Um, the character, the characters in the world are transformed as this crisis unfolds. We have a new status quo that's established, a new situation, and this could be positive, it could be negative, but the world is now resolved into a roughly, uh, uh, roughly stable situation that has changed from the beginning. And usually it's the shortest section of the narrative. It's usually the briefest part of it. So to go over those terms, just again, look at them a little bit more detail. The exposition, this is where we have the situation established, the characters, the world established, the world is exposed to us as readers. And again, it's often very brief, usually one of the shortest parts of the story. The inciting incident, that's what sets the plot in motion. It creates conflict and it inserts change into the situation. Something happens to change that status quo. And this could be a literal event, uh, there's an invasion, aliens arrive, someone dies, someone gets married, uh, or it can be an internal change of perspective. Someone can, or, or both, someone can see things a little bit differently and this causes them to act differently and change the, uh, uh, change the situation, change the status quo. And in complex stories, it's often difficult to pinpoint what the single incident is. Uh, it might be actually rather than one specific thing, it might be a whole complex, a whole uh, system of uh, events that occur to change the situation. So the inciting is incident isn't necessarily just one action, but it's uh, a, a set of actions that disrupt the status quo and get the story started. Conflict, right? So conflict is essential to any story. Without conflict, there is no story. It's the struggle between opposed forces, i.e. the protagonist and the antagonist, the hero and the villain. The conflict is the fuel that runs the story. It, it's what gives the story a reason to exist. And conflict can be external, in which we have a struggle between the main character, uh, the protagonist, and an external force, such as other characters or social institutions, the natural world, God, or the supernatural, right? So it's a struggle between this person and something outside of them. Conflict can also be internal, where it's the struggle of the protagonist against some aspect of themselves, of their internal self, whether it's forbidden desires, psychological trauma, conflicting motivations, right? So internal struggle, internal conflict is when the, the conflict of the main character is not with something outside of themselves, but with something inside of themselves. And of course, most stories, uh, or at least many stories, the conflicts are both external and internal. In some way, the external often stands for or represents the internal and vice versa.
So the rising action, right? It's when the events are set in motion by the inciting incident and that they affect the situation and the characters. So the events that have happened, they, they start to continue to change the status quo based on the uh, uh, disruption caused by the inciting incident. And situation may continue to develop through additional complications and new conflicts, right? And this is the longest part of the story. The rising action is, is again, as I said, what we mainly read for. We want to see what happens. And a complication is simply just the introduction of a new conflict or the intensification of an existing conflict. It develops the plot. The crisis point at the story is the moment of most extreme conflict. This may be the same uh, as the climax, or it might precede the climax a little bit. The crisis point might lead into the climactic confrontation. Uh, and so at the crisis, this is where the protagonist faces their most extreme challenge. Things are at their worst, we could say. And the climax is the turning point where the action stops rising and begins to fall towards resolution. In other words, the crisis is resolved. Uh, again, might not necessarily be a positive resolution, but the crisis, the conflicts that have been uh, motivating, moving the story along, are settled in some way or another. And of course, this again leads to the falling action, where the conflict or conflicts begin to move towards their final resolution. This is where we see the consequences of whatever happened at that climax start to unfold. So what are the consequences of uh, the actions that the main characters have taken to resolve the problem, the situation? And the falling action is, is usually very short, right? In most stories, falling action is pretty short compared to, uh, obviously compared to the rising action. And then the, the resolution or conclusion, this is where the conflicts uh, uh, are finally resolved to some extent or another. The, the unfolding of the cr uh, climactic action ends and the world and characters have been transformed, but we return to a new status quo after the initial destabilization caused by the inciting incident. Uh, it's usually very short, right? The resolution and con conclusion can be very short. It can be just a few lines. And depending on the nature of the story, the resolution may be more or less satisfying. That is, are there loose ends left? Uh, do we get the sense that, that the problem has really been solved or is it just going to recur again? Uh, some stories end where we say, okay, it's over. No more to think about. But other stories stay with us. And uh, we may think, well, there's still more to happen in this world, even though the story is over. Now, there's an important clarification to be made here. The plot, as I said, is the events of the story, the events in which the story is told. But that's not necessarily the order in which the events occur. If you think about when you tell stories to people, you might jump around in time. You might start the story and say, oh, well, I need to go back and tell you about something that happened earlier in order to make sense of, of what I'm talking about. Or you may jump ahead to something that happens later and then come back to it. Right, so the plot is the events in the story in the order in which they're told. And this may be non-chronological. It may jump around in time. But the action is, I'm using that term to describe the events in the story in the order in which they occur. So that's the chronological order, the order in which they occurred in time. So a plot might include things like flashbacks or flash forwards, but the action uh, is something that's not, it's not really the plot itself, it's not the story itself, but it's if you were to take the uh, events out of the story and then arrange them into chronological order. So some stories are told in a traditional uh, standard chronological format. This happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, A, B, C, D. Uh, but there are a lot of stories that are told in non-linear or non-chronological fashion. Uh, and this can build suspense because we might be exposed to, we might see something happen and we wonder, well, why are they doing that? What's, what's the cause of that? And then we later learn uh, about some earlier event that gives new meaning to the things that we've already seen. Uh, so it can build suspense. It creates new patterns and, and unexpected juxtapositions as things that we thought we understood from earlier in the story suddenly transform their meaning when we learn something new. And 
nonlinear narratives are full of flashbacks and flash forwards where events from the past or the future are inserted into the narrative. And this can add new meanings by, by again, showing us the connection between different moments in time and how one thing in the past uh, conditions something happening in the present and shapes something that's gonna happen in the future. Or how something in the, in the future looks back to, is, is a product of something in the present. So here are a few examples of some uh, nonlinear plots from popular TV shows and films. Uh, very common in superhero stories, Captain Marvel, Batman Begins, Dark Knight Rises, the Daredevil and Jessica Jones TV shows, all of them contain extensive flashbacks where the action is going along and then we flash back to an earlier period in the character's life. We learn about their origin, how they got their powers, uh, a traumatic event that set them down the path towards becoming a superhero, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, TV show Stranger Things has a lot of flashbacks, as does The Walking Dead. Westworld, if you watch that TV show, it's built with multiple uh, timelines going on, um, being, being intertwined. So we're seeing events that are decades apart in the same plot. Uh, Pulp Fiction, Kill Bill, in fact, most Tarantino films are uh, non-linear in organization. We see lots of flashbacks in his films and, and uh, sometimes even very difficult to figure out what you know, where we are in the narrative. Uh, Sin City, another comic book story that had a lot of flashbacks, Slumdog Millionaire, when the character is uh, on stage in the Who Wants to Be a Millionaire show, he flashes back to earlier events in his life and that's how he, he gets the answers right. Memento, one of the more famous examples of nonlinear plots, a story that is told backwards, um, where each scene, we then see the scene that precedes it and the scene that precedes that. 500 Days of Summer, the the uh, kind of uh, romantic drama film, which shows us the falling apart of a relationship, but we see moments from the beginning, moments from the end, moments from the middle, all mixed together. So we see how this relationship um, developed over a, a, developed in a complicated fashion over a long period of time. So these are just some examples of uh, out of many of nonlinear plots that you might be familiar with. So this issue of chronological versus non-chronological brings us to the question that every writer faces, which is where do I begin? How do I start the story? Uh, and there's two traditional Latin terms that have been around for a couple thousand years. Uh, in media res, which means in the middle of the thing or in the middle of things, and ab ovo, which means from the egg. So the idea here is that uh, in media res is where the story starts in the midst of the action. The larger story is already underway and any exposition or backstory is revealed along the way, perhaps through flashback. So, you know, like The Dark Knight Rises is an example of a story that's in media res. We start with the conflict already happening, and then we have the flashback to earlier uh, when we learn about um, the, the uh, rise of Bane and et cetera, et cetera. Ab ovo means that the story starts at the absolute beginning possible. So a Batman movie that started ab ovo, for example, would start with Batman, would start with the young Bruce Wayne, and then go through, show the event with his parents getting killed, show him training to become Batman, and then eventually show him as Batman. So it starts at the very beginning of the story itself. Uh, and since antiquity, the idea has been that in media res is preferred. It gives you some energy, right? Um, where if you start at the very beginning, it can, it can take a while to how, well, if the story is really about Batman, why do we need to see 20 years of him growing up? Why don't we, I want to see Batman fighting. Um, so in media res is generally thought of as the preferred way to start because the audience, the readers are thrust right into the action. Um, and the classic example is the Iliad of Homer, which is the uh, one of the early great works of the Western tradition. It's a story of the Trojan War, but it begins in the last year of the Trojan War. The war has already been going on for nine years. So rather than beginning with the birth of Helen of Troy, who was the, the person that the wars fought over, and she was magically hatched from an egg. So the idea is, well, we could have, Homer could have started with the birth of Helen of Troy, gone through her life, gone through her uh, marriage and then kidnapping, and then get us to the Trojan War. Or he can start us already in the Trojan War and then show us what we need to know about the other characters and what led to it as we're going along.
when we read a story or watch a movie or any consume any sort of narrative, we are, of course, interested in the literal events themselves, the things that are happening. Uh, we want to know what happens and we want to be entertained or amused or moved or saddened by those events. But we also want something more. We want meaning. We want something, some vision of the world, some understanding of reality that is projected through the story. Um, and the story itself, those literal, literal events, the way they are constructed, the way they're organized, the types of events, the cause and effect between the uh, actions, the uh, uh, elements in the story, um, those themselves create that deeper meaning. They create and communicate the important themes that we want to give us something more than just uh, witnessing a series of things happening. Um, some broad questions to ask to help us get to this sense of meaning beyond the literal events, but yet communicated through the events. We can ask ourselves what choices are offered to the characters? What are the consequences of their actions? And do the characters deserve the ultimate outcome? Do they deserve what happens to them? And these questions, I think, can help us to understand the kind of world that the plot uh, is occurring in, right? Is this a fair universe or an unfair universe? Are these people, uh, what kind of uh, life are these people li living? Do they have privilege or are they struggling? Um, is this, is the outcome of events, is it determined by logic or reason or are there unseen forces or powerful forces at work that control people's lives and their actions? Or is it just random chance? Is there some sort of uh, divine plan or is it all meaningless, right? These are the kinds of things that the big questions that by looking at these details of the plot, we can start to get, get at. So now let's look at some uh, specifics. So when, when analyzing the plot, one thing to think about is the structure of events. That is um, just literally the events and the order in which they occur, they occur and how the characters move, uh, figuratively speaking, up or down in status or in state. Um, looking at that can tell us a lot about the, uh, the world that the author is trying to create um, and start to raise more significant questions. So for example, uh, looking at the jewelry, if we were to map out Lanton's journey through the story, right? He begins uh, a bachelor and he, first major event is he's married. Second major event is his wife dies. Um, which devastates him. There's the revelation about the false jewelry as he, uh, which devastates him even further. But then there's the reversal of wealth, um, which makes him at least briefly very happy. And then the last event that occurs is the second marriage, um, which is uh, uh, a misery. So yet another turn at the end. And so in this journey, we can think about the, uh, the state that Lanton's in and how each event transforms him. Right. So the marriage brings him into a life of joy and comfort as his wife takes care of him um, and, and gives him everything he needs. There's then the wife's death, which is a sudden descent into despair and also poverty. So it's this sudden reversal of his state. Uh, then there's the revelation about the false jewelry, this moment of crisis. Um, and in that moment, uh, he experiences an initial despair because Everything that comes before is in some sense overturned or tainted. The marriage of, uh, the memory of his marriage and his wife is now sullied with the possibility that she was unfaithful. Uh, but at the same time, this leads him to this reversal of fortune where he is wealthy. Um, he gets all this money from the real jewelry, which also brings about a sense of arrogance. Uh, he's happy, but he's also arrogant. So this isn't, this is different from the kind of joy he felt initially when he was first married. Uh, and then the second marriage, again, another reversal of fortune, even though he is still wealthy, he's now miserable. Um, and so just looking at it like this, we can see uh, a very complicated pattern emerging for Lanton, um, the main character. And this, can, uh, this tells us a lot in itself, but it can also lead us to uh, other questions about the relationship between these events and how they uh, cause and affect each other. So let's talk about cause and effect, uh, both on the literal level, that is events that, that occur in the story and which there's a necessary and, and logical and often physical reason for one to lead into the other. So for example, the wife gets uh, sick and she dies, right? The pneumonia leads to her death. That's a literal cause and effect relationship, uh, but also figurative cause and effect. 
um, that is cause uh, relationships of cause and effect that are not quite so obvious or that they're more metaphysical uh, in some sense. Uh, for example, the issue of Lanton's behavior towards his wife. In what way does his behavior shape his wife's actions? So let's take the jewelry as an example. Um, if the wife was unfaithful, which is what I think generally seems to be the most common and, and likely interpretation of uh, the, the way she got the real jewelry um, and the situation behind that, we would want to know why. Right? We never, that's a question that's left open in this story. We never actually see uh, anything of, of her psychology. We don't get any of her thoughts or anything like that. And we only see what Lanton sees of her. So why did this happen? Um, was it a case that she was always false? That uh, at the beginning of the story when it notes how, uh, describes how she seems like the ideal woman and seems, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a, a subtle signal that she was always false? that this was always going to happen just because of the kind of person she was. was it, is it a case of the husband's neglect? Did that cause her to be unfaithful? Uh, remember, he refuses to go with her to the theater because he finds it too boring and, and tedious after a long day at work. Or was it perhaps her love of jewelry? Was she seduced, tempted by some wealthy man to, to have an affair because she just couldn't resist the beautiful jewelry that he offered to her, which Lanton couldn't offer? Or was it perhaps something more selfless? Was it a desire to support her husband? Remember, she keeps such a, a wonderful household management that he seems to live in luxury, even though he doesn't make that much money. Was the, the possibility, was she selling herself in some way to earn money to keep her, her husband happy? All of these are, are possibilities, and they are not necessarily uh, mutually exclusive from each other, but we never really know. So they're always left there. That question of cause and effect is always left lingering. I think that's one of the, the important points about the jewelry. We can also think about uh, a more figurative issue of cause and effect, like the, the husband's happiness. What caused his happiness? Was it his wife's beauty? Because we know she's a beautiful woman. Um, and is, so was it just a sense of appearance? Was it his wife's attentions to him, you know, their relationship, how much she cared for him and, and all the uh, uh, kindnesses she did? Uh, was it her presumed fidelity? Right? Up until he finds out about the jewelry, he assumes that she's been faithful. He has a, a perfect memory of her. She's an angel in his memory. So is it the sense that she was his, uh, almost a kind of possession? Is that what made him happy? Or was it maybe her household management? The fact that she was such a good uh, uh, manager when it came to running the house's budget, um, that they lived in such great material comfort, is that what made him happy? Or again, was it some combination of these or something even more beyond them? And this is an important question because Lanton transforms near the end of the story and, and seems to become almost a different person. And so the question of what really made him happy, uh, I think is something that sticks with us. And at the same time, we can think about his unhappiness, both initially in the story after his wife dies, uh, and then as we learn at the end, and after the end of the story when his second wife makes him miserable. Was it the loss of his wife's beauty and her attentions? Was it that, that having this beautiful wife that would do so many things for him? Um, is that what uh, uh, d made him despair? Was it the loss of the household management, which plunges him into poverty, as we see? Um, is that what really makes him miserable? Is it the fact that he learns that she's unfaithful? Was that, uh, what, was that the most devastating cause of his un unhappiness? Is it the attitude of his second wife that makes him unhappy? Or is there something more to it, right? Again, with all of these, there are, there are uh, uh, answers suggested by the text, but we never get a, a definite answer to any of these questions, uh, particularly when we're thinking about what is it that really makes Lanton happy or unhappy, what makes him love this, this first wife if he does love her, what makes him choose the second wife. Um, these are questions that I think the story asks because these are characters dealing with extreme emotional trauma and trying to struggle through that. And in these moments, they, their truth is revealed, I think. We can also think about the relationship between events. That is not necessarily events that are cause and effect, but, but how they might echo or contrast each other in some uh, more figurative way. So for example, in The Company of Wolves, we might compare the grandmother's reaction to the wolf and the girl's reaction to the wolf and the consequences of their different reactions. The grandmother rejects the wolf, tries to hide from him, tries to protect herself against his attack, and it fails. Whereas the girl simply ignores 
uh, the idea that he is uh, a predator and takes the initiative and she survives and in fact tames the wolf. All right, so there's a there's a, an important distinction there between their actions and the consequences of it. Um, we can think about the events in the first half of the story and the girl's story. How does how do those narratives uh, help shape our understanding, or how do they relate to what happens to the girl in the second half? The stories of the the wife whose first husband leaves her um, and becomes a wolf, or the story of the man who tried to catch a wolf and when he killed it, it, it turned back into a, a human. Right? How do those set the? Uh, how do those resonate with, or reflect, or contrast with events in the girl's story? And then the girl's decision to let the huntsman win and her taming of the wolf. Right? There's an irony in that. In in some sense, the first is the cause of the second. Right? She desire. She lets the huntsman win the race to the the grandmother's house because she wants to have to kiss him, um, and her ultimate taming of the wolf is an act of taking initiative. But on the other hand, her decision to let the huntsman win is an act of passivity, whereas her taming of the wolf is uh, an action, is an active action. It's not just a passive reception. So these are more metaphysical or, or uh, uh, figurative relationships between events. But again, they can help us understand the, the important themes and contrasts and ideas that the authors are trying to develop. When we look at the plot, we also want to make sure that we uh, look for patterns and important details, that is, repetitions of kinds of events that occur, uh, because that can help us to understand, again, the nature of the world um, and, the, and the, the significance of the actions and what the story is, is really about beyond the, the literal the events themselves. So, for example, in both The Werewolf and The Company of Wolves, there's a lot of examples of crossing borders. Bears are said to wander into the graveyards. The devil comes and has picnics at night, at midnight in the graveyards as well. The girl goes through the forest to her grandmother's house. The grandmother is chased out of the house and to the very edge of the forest. Uh, and then in the company of wolves, we have uh, you know mostly very similar actions. Also the talk of the knight entering the house and the wolf enters the house, the grandmother's house. So we have a lot of border crossings where one person or being goes into another space uh, and usually a space that it's not expected or supposed to be in. It's a kind of violation of the implicit borders between, in this case, uh, nature and civilization, the human world and the demonic world, um, human, the human world and the animal world, right? All those borders are crossed. And that, again, brings to light the significant issues in the stories themselves. There are also many transformations in these, uh, in these tales. Um, the wolf becomes the grandmother in The Werewolf. And the girl becomes a woman and replaces the grandmother in The Werewolf. In the company of wolves, there's the story in uh, in the first half about the dismembered wolf that becomes a dismembered man after the wolf is caught and killed. Its body parts turn back to human body parts. Um, on the other hand, we know that a naked man becomes a naked wolf once the the man takes his clothes off, and if those are burned, then he is forever a wolf. Um, at the end, the girl becomes again a woman. She's maturing into her sexual maturity, and she becomes a wife. But in becoming a wife, the savage wolf becomes tame. She tames it. So we have these uh, literal transformations as well as figurative transformations going on throughout the stories. And finally, the plot often brings up questions of fate, free will, destiny, uh, significant questions about, about chance and cause and effect, just broader sort of metaphysical questions about the nature of reality and, and how in control we are of our own lives and the meaning of our own lives. So for example, in the jewelry, some, some important questions that I think are, are raised and, and never really answered, but that are the point of the story is, was Lanton's wife really having an affair? Or was it something else? And the fact that we are, this is heavily suggested, but we don't know, um, does that tell us something, perhaps about our own attitudes and presumptions about men and women? Did Lanton cause his wife's infidelity? Um, is he somehow to blame for her having an affair because of perhaps his neglect, right, through not going to the, the theater? And is he ultimately better off knowing or not knowing? I mean, certainly he's better off knowing that the jewelry is real and he can get that money, but would he be better off not knowing that his wife had possibly cheated on him? Is it better to know that you've been betrayed and be unhappy or to be betrayed and be happy? <laughs>
For another example, we can look at a good man is hard to find. We could ask ourselves, does the grandmother cause the accident or in what ways does she cause the accident? And again, how guilty should we should we uh, uh, judge her for that? So on the one hand, she's the reason that they're on the dirt road. She thought that it led to a particular uh, uh, old uh, plantation home, but it's not the right road. So she's the cause in that sense. She's also the cause because she brought the cat along when it, she wasn't supposed to and disturbed it. So it jumped on her son and caused him to drive the, the car off the road. But are these merely accidents? Are these sins? Did she do something wrong or are these just, you know, slip ups? Was the family doomed when they began the journey? Were they always going to eventually uh, uh, meet the misfit or have something horrible happen to him and it just happened to be the misfit? And were they doomed when they, when they met him? Could they have survived? Is there some possible way that they could have uh, avoided their death at the hands of the misfit? And again, is it the grandmother's fault? Does she have a true revelation at the end? Is what happens to her at the end in the moments before her death a true uh, recognition of some higher reality, some higher order? Does she see some connection between herself and the misfit and, and other humans that had eluded her throughout her rather petty life? Same for the misfit. Does he have some sort of revelation at the end about his relationship to the grandmother and the nature of his actions? Right. All of these are uh, uh, open questions, but they are the, the important questions. All right, let's review. So when looking at plot, some important questions to ask to get a sense of, of the overall world and how the, the plot structure and the events that occur, the actions, how those uh, contribute to some larger significance, we want to ask ourselves, what is the world like at the beginning of the story? Right? What is the status quo? What seems to be normal or accepted? And this tells us a lot about who we're going to see, uh, the kinds of things that might happen, the values by which the characters and their actions are going to be judged, uh, perhaps the, the possible consequences of different types of actions. And it tells us what's at stake. What are the characters fighting for? What are they trying to return to? Or perhaps what are they trying to change? What conflicts arise? What are the actions that that or events that set the story in motion? And where do they come from? To what extent are these actions or events um, a result of the status quo itself, some internal conflict? Or to what extent are they a result of the character's actions? How do the characters themselves then react? And, and how do their actions contribute to the ongoing plot? How do they either try to complicate uh, uh, the plot? How do they, what mistakes do they make? And what attempts do they make to try to resolve the problems? And how effective are they? Where do we finally reach the point of most crisis, most conflict, tension, tension, danger? Where do we reach the climax where things can't go any farther and there has to be a, a dramatic transformation or dramatic shift? And in that shift, is it really resolved? Is the problem resolved or is it just displaced temporarily? When we get to the end of the story, what is the new status quo? How have things changed, the characters, the world around them? And is this new status quo going to be stable? Or is this merely a, a waypoint before the next crisis point, the next round of, of problems and conflicts? All right, everyone, that's the end of this uh, presentation on plot and meaning. Um, I hope that it was helpful. I hope that it was useful and clear and, and understandable. If you have any questions um, or issues with anything, uh, anything was unclear, please let me know. Uh, you can feel free to comment below, or if you're one of my students, feel free to email me directly. Um, again, I hope that you enjoyed this. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care.